Let's get on with it then. So last time we were talking about the efficiency gap, and this you have some uh, practice on your homework. Efficiency gap. And it measures, um, it's a number, right? And it measures um, packing by counting wasted votes. All right. I don't know if anybody heard, there was a big um, Supreme Court decision about gerrymandering yesterday. It was actually not much of a big decision. It was one of those times, like sometimes the court will hear a case and then make an official decision. Sometimes the court will refuse to hear the case and then it just means that like whatever earlier decision had already been made will just stay uh, like it is. And that happened with, um, there were two uh, cases in which the Republicans said that the Democrats were drawing unfair maps and the, uh, the Supreme Court refused to hear the cases, which means basically the Democrats got their way in these two cases. The, um, what their maps, which, which are contested, are allowed to remain. Um, this is how it works. Usually the only thing they can do if they think the other side is, is, uh, is cheating by gerrymandering, pretty much the only thing they have to do is go to the, to the courts and hope that the judges uh, agree with them. Anyway, I don't think that they talked about the efficiency gap, but the efficiency gap has actually been used in Supreme Court cases. But anyway, um, Counting wasted votes is the idea. Uh, I wanted to say, I had hoped to get this in at the end last time, because we're actually gonna move on to something else today, but um, in the real world, we did several examples, like, and most of the examples that we did had very few districts, just because that, then it's possible to do it by hand. Um, in the real world, you only use the efficiency gap um, when there are many, many districts, like 50 districts or something like that. We only use the efficiency gap with many, many districts. The examples that we did in class, like by hand, and the ones on the homework, for instance, about the, um, the Pikachu, um, those examples have like only three or four districts. And in those situations, actually, people don't use the efficiency gap in, in that way because the reason is because um, the efficiency gap is a statistical measure. And most statistical measures are only meaningful when you have a large population with which to do your averages or whatever, right? If you only have a small uh, population, and in the case of, of the efficiency gap, if you only have like three or four districts, when you do the efficiency gap, the result is not really regarded as representative of what's really going on. You really need a lot of districts in order for it to be meaningful. So in the real world, we only use the efficiency gap with many, many districts. Like last time, at the end last time, we did the Connecticut um, US House districts, of which there are five, right? And we found that the efficiency gap was something like around 25%. That number actually is, is way too high. In the real world, this would be regarded as an absurdly large efficiency gap. Um, the reason that, now this was the real world that we were using in this example, but with only five districts, nobody would take this, this statistic seriously. But if this statistic, if you did get 25%, say in, in, a, um, in a state with 100 districts, that would be regarded as um, super unfair in terms of packing. So in the uh, US House districts, the efficiency gap was about 25%. But I'm just going to say this is um, not very meaningful. with so few districts. And also just the fact that in Connecticut, all the districts are Democrats, which means automatically every single Republican vote in the state will be counted as wasted. Um, that's not a very meaningful thing if you are uh, doing your statistics and considering every Republican vote in the whole state to be a wasted vote. Um, I mean, that's how the numbers go. But this is not regarded as a meaningful statistic uh, with, uh, with a population like that. It works the best when you have many, many districts and 
when you have some kind of political diversity so that you know many of the districts are going to go for the Democrats, many of the districts are going to go for the Republicans, and you can make good comparisons in that way. Connecticut is a very bad uh, sort of um, scenario in which to use the uh, efficiency gap. You know, I wanted to do it just because it's small so we can all do it by hand, but um, in the real world you wouldn't do this. So I will just tell you in the um, uh, What's regarded in like American politics as something like a normal range is something like zero to five percent. And actually there have been efforts to make laws that say like you're not allowed to draw a map if the efficiency gap is, is over 10% or something like that. Um, yeah, a normal range is zero to five percent, something like greater than I um, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not super into politics. Like, I'm not an expert in politics. But I read somewhere that they say that if your efficiency gap is greater than seven percent, this is regarded as um, suspicious, sus, as the kids say these days. More than more than seven percent efficiency gap is regarded as as a red flag. Doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's trying to cheat, but it's uh, you know. It's sus. And um, that map that I showed you before of Wisconsin, which had the, like, that, that looked like it was being packed. It had the super dark uh, Democratic districts right next to a bunch of light Republican districts. Um, that was the Wisconsin. That was the map from 2018, like I said, just because I, I couldn't find a good picture from the more recent one. Anyway, this had 10% um, efficiency gap. And this was um, among the worst. It, uh, in like analysis of all the different states. Um, this was among the worst. And this was in favor, that map um, advantaged the Republicans and it disadvantaged the Democrats. Uh, and if you look over the country as a whole, generally speaking, the gerrymanders that exist in the, in the country right now are favorable to the Republicans. Um, there was a big political movement like in the 90s where the Republicans figured out that they could uh, get big advantages by gerrymandering. And the Democrats, they do it too, but they were a little late to the game. Um, the worst, uh, and this is regarded as one of the worst in the country, the worst for the Democrats actually, uh, the, the conventional wisdom is that uh, Rhode Island is very um, sort of unfairly ge uh, gerrymandered in favor of the Democrats. I don't know anything about Rhode Island, but this is what they tell me. Um, these kinds of measures, I also wanted to say, they have been actually used in front of the Supreme Court to try to argue that various maps are unjust with varying success. Um, this, a few years ago, was argued, somebody argued in front of the Supreme Court, and our uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts, called the efficiency gap you know, some lawyers said, hey, if you do this statistical measurement, you can see that this, this, is, uh, this is unfair. Um, John Roberts saw this and referred to it as gobbledygook. So apparently he was unimpressed, or maybe it was just too complicated, the math for him. I would say it's not that complicated, although, I mean, you have to kind of think about it and concentrate in order to understand what it's all about. Um, you know, one, uh, one moral of the story, and I've, I've certainly noticed this in my own life, trying to, um, trying to explain what, what seems to me to be simple mathematics, trying to explain to other people, often they're just not into it at all, and they don't want to hear about that. And that, you know, I understand that. Um, that's why I don't go to the club anymore. Uh, no, I, I have other reasons for not going to the club. But uh, yeah, anyway, the efficiency gap, I don't know if it was because John Roberts hates math or because the lawyers were not explaining very well, but it's a hard sell. That's all I'm saying. All right. These are my concluding remarks about the efficiency gap. I had hoped to say this at the end last time, but I didn't get to it. Um, I want to, uh, you know, I said we were going to talk about a few different measures of gerrymandering. The idea here is if I show you a map, can you tell me if it has been gerrymandered or not? The first one was the efficiency gap, and uh, we've said all that we're going to say about the efficiency gap. Anyone have any final remarks about the efficiency gap? It is, I think, the most well-known uh, statistical measure of 
fairness of gerrymanders. And it's basically used all the time, uh, although many people don't take it seriously. As you can see, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court was not into it. Um, I want to talk about two other measures which are completely different. I want to talk about two geometric measures of gerrymandering. Uh, the efficiency gap, I don't know if you notice this. I'm, well, you will notice it when I say so. The efficiency gap actually has nothing to do with the geometry of the shapes that you use in the map. It just has to do with how many voters are in each district, right? That's why, for instance, we did the uh, efficiency gap for the Connecticut districts. You don't even need to look at a map for that. It's just about counting up the votes. Um, but I want to talk about two other geometric measures. That is, these ones involve looking at the shapes and we are going to try to measure how crazy the shapes are. This is actually the classical sort of when you talk to an ordinary person about gerrymandering, usually you talk in these terms. It's about when people draw crazy shapes in order to influence or to sort of cheat the outcome of the elections, all right? And what we're going to talk about are two different measures of how crazy the shapes are. Um, we're not even going to look at the voters or, or anything, just about how wild the shapes are. So for example, um, something that's like this, I would say this is not too crazy, because it's sort of like a, I mean, it's a weird shape, but it's at least like a more or less ordinary looking blobby shape versus something like this, right? This is crazy, all right? So what we're gonna talk about is some very specific ways, like geometrically, that you can look at a shape and measure sort of how wiggly it is or how snaky it is versus you know this one over here, which is not terribly snaky, all right? This is something that, you know, you could teach kids how to do this. Kids who learn geometry, they never learn about how do you measure how wiggly a shape is. But this is what we're going to talk about. How do you measure specifically how wiggly this shape is? Um, we're actually going to talk about two specific um, sort of, uh, I will call these um, measures of wiggliness. All right, and they have fun names. So the first one, which is a little bit simpler, is called the complex hull ratio. And this is what we're going to talk about today. And then the second one has a fancier name. It's called the isoperimetric quotient. And this actually quotient Sorry, it's quotient. And as usual, both of these are going to boil down to percentages. And so you can say this, this shape is like, you know, 5% wiggly or whatever. That's, that's the way that these work. These are two different specific geometric measures of how wiggly the shape is. This isoperimetric quotient also in, um, in politics, it is, this is kind of the mathematical name for it. But in politics, it has this other name. This is named after the people who first used it in, in the study of uh, politics. It's called the Polsby Popper score, which I kind of like. Um, anyway, both of these give you um, a specific number between 0 and 1 which you can interpret as a percentage if you want. And the um, one is like best. So the way that these work is one is sort of uh, best, indicating not very wiggly. And zero is worst, indicating something that is like as wiggly as possible. 
very wiggly. All right. This is how the numbers work. You can write them as percentages too, but the, the basic idea is if your answer is close to one, that's good. Um, it means it looks like, uh, you know, like a square or something would be very uh, close to one. And if the thing is close to zero, that means it's super wiggly and that's bad. All right. Okay, let's talk about the first one. It's called the convex hull score. Let's talk about, or the convex hull ratio. I gotta tell you what the convex hull means. This is a, a geometric concept that you could teach to any kid. It's not that complicated. And actually, um, uh, some kids I think have some, well, I think everybody has some kind of intuitive idea of this concept, but it's not typically, doesn't come up in math classes usually, and so it's not, I assume, something that you have uh, not talked about before. But anyway, this is some basic geometry here. Um, a set, by which I mean, you know, a, a blob, a, a shape, right? I should, I could call it a shape. A shape is convex. Maybe you've uh, seen this word in a geometric context before. A shape is convex when, this has a complicated definition, but it's actually very simple to see. You can look at any shape and, and you should be able to say immediately if it's convex or not. But I'll write the definition first. A shape is convex when the straight line between any two points in the shape lies entirely inside the shape. All right, the straight line between any two points in the shape, that line, the whole line, lies entirely inside the shape. So, for example, I'm just going to draw some shapes here. Is it convex or not? This square or rectangle, imagine the sides are, uh, are straight, all right? Is that convex or not? The question is, if I choose any two points inside here, say I'll pick those two points, Draw the straight line between those points. Is that straight line entirely inside the shape? The answer is yes. And is that, uh, and that's not special for those two points, right? Any two points inside the square and, uh, or on the boundary, it doesn't really matter if you consider the boundary also. Any two points inside the square, the line connecting them, the straight line connecting them is also inside the square. So this one is convex, all right? Whereas something like, uh, this say this one is not convex can you see two points where the straight line connecting those two points does not stay inside the shape I think you can something like a point over here and a point over here the straight line connecting those two points leaves the shape this that's that's bad right so this one is not convex all right that's what convex means. Any, any shape you can, uh, you can ask yourself, is it convex or not? So how about just some more very simple examples? How about a circle? What do you say? Give me the thumbs. Is, is convex or is not? I see some thumbs up. Yeah, any two points inside the circle, the line connecting them will stay inside the circle. So this one is convex, is. Uh, how about something like um, my hand? Is that convex or not? I could trace, my hand is too big for the screen. Doesn't that look like my hand? <laughs> is that convex or not? No, it is not because um, any, you know, there are many ways you could choose two points in the hand and the line between them is not in the hand. So this one is not convex, right? Uh, how about something like uh, a circle, but it's got sort of a little, a little something like that cut out of it? This one also is not convex, right? Because you can do something like this, and that line leaves the circle. So this one is not convex. All right. It's kind of like uh, you know when I was a kid, they said some um, talk about people's belly buttons. They said some people got an innie. 
some people got an Audi, right? Convex kind of means like there's no any, right? Like here, there's no, there's no innies. So you can't make two points. The line between them always goes, uh, stays in the set. Whereas here, this, is, this whole region here is kind of like, a, like an innie. It's digging into the rest of the set, all right? I'm talking about innies here, like over here. This, this region here is like digging into the, the shape of the, uh, of the set, which is why it's not convex. Okay, um, I would say in general, if you just like encounter a shape in the real world, a shape of real world objects, generally things in real life are not convex because they have some amount of wiggliness to them, right? So I will say most natural shapes in the real world are not convex because there's some amount of wiggliness to them, right? Like your head is probably not convex. I mean, your head is like more or less a circle or like an oval kind of a shape. But if you really look at the shape of your head, you have, you know, ears, whatever. And you, you might have some sort of wiggly, wiggly chin or something, right? All those wiggles make it not convex. All right, this is not, this is supposed to be a picture of a head. I'm not much of an, ex, uh, an artist here, all right? I would say a head is like mostly convex, but it has some little wiggles on the sides. It's not like wildly uh, non-convex, all right? Most natural shapes are not convex. We can always, and the, here's the important thing about the convex hull, we can always, I will say this something like, box in or like fill in a shape to make it convex. For example, in this weird shape that I drew here, which doesn't really look like uh, a head, you can kind of fill in all the, all the innies until it becomes convex. And I'm gonna, I'll do this in red. What I mean is like one place where it's not convex is right around here because I can make a point over here and another point over here where the line in between them leaves the shape. I can sort of fill that in by connecting up this area. All right, and I can go over here and fill this area in. And if I fill in all the innies, then it becomes convex just because I filled everything in. So uh, if I wanted to really do this, I would fill this in here, maybe right Right there, maybe it needs a little, a little something, a little work done. There, right? I think I filled in all the innies here. Once you fill it in, you get a shape that is convex, and that shape, the new shape you get, is called the convex hull. So if we fill, uh, fill in all the innies, if we fill in all the non-convex parts, We get a convex shape, and that is called the convex hull of the original thing. We get a convex shape called the convex hull. All right, it's called the convex hull of whatever you started with. You can start with a shape, you fill it in, to make it convex, that new shape is called the convex hull. So for example, if I started with, um, say, a shape making a capital letter A, all right, I know how to draw a capital letter A. This is not convex. Uh, why not? Because of this part, really, and because of the hole in the middle, right? Um, but you can fill those parts in and then it becomes convex. So what would the convex hull look like? The convex hull of that shape, maybe I'll do a little copy paste here and I'll fill it in. It would look like uh, you have to fill this part in and you also have to fill in that hole in the middle and then take this whole thing. So it looks basically like this. That's the convex hull, right? If I were to redraw the whole shape. It's the original shape, but you also add in all the stuff that you need to add in to make it convex. 
this is kind of like, um, I remember when I was a kid, if I was like in school and bored with what my teacher was talking about and there was a handout, I would do things like, I would do like this, fill, fill in here, fill these guys in, right? You ever do that when you're bored? It's kind of like that, although the convex hull would fill even more stuff, like right here. Um, I filled in that part of the E, the little hole. If you were doing the convex hull, you would also connect it up like that and fill this whole thing in. And I guess fill that in too. Now it's convex, right? Not only filling in the holes, but also filling in any part of kind of uh, any parts of the shape. All right. This is why I said kids. Some kids are aware of the convex hull, even if you don't uh, if you if you don't discuss it with them. So what I have is I have sort of a silly handout of a bunch of shapes, and I would like you to scribble in the shapes until it becomes the convex hull. Maybe I'll do just one more. What if I had something like a nice delightful heart. Can we fill this in to make it the convex hull? You want to look at where are the parts of the shape which are kind of innies or parts where um, it's not convex. I would identify up here as a part where it's not convex. So I'm going to connect, maybe I'll, I'll copy and paste just so you can see how we're doing here. I would connect up that part. Anywhere else? I mean, I also uh, obviously take, take this whole part of the shape. Is that convex now? Yeah, actually, it's not quite. This may be details of my picture. Can we say um, it's still not quite convex? Yeah, I see somebody doing this. The shapeliness of the sides there, the curvaceous curves. See this thing? That actually is not convex because I can go, say, take a point here and a point here, and it goes outside, right? So you got to fill those in too. The curvy curves, not into it. In this case, I would guess I would have to take a straight line from the bottom all the way up the side to straighten it out, all right? And on the left side also, there's a slight curve there, which I'm going to straighten out. All right, now this is convex. Fill that whole thing in. That's the idea. This is, so the thing on the left is the original shape. The thing on the right is called the convex hull. All right, I got a handout of shapes here. In each case, I would like you to draw the convex hull. This is not hard. This will only take you a moment, probably. These are kind of silly shapes. So we're all clear on what the convex hull means. I put a smiley face on one of the shapes. That you can ignore that. It's because my my pen kind of slipped when I was doing it, and I I like the look of it, so I added a. A little smiley. Everybody got one? This should not be hard. So the heart is first there. I will do what we just did. I'm going to walk around and see how you're doing.
Some of these are already convex, so in that case, you wouldn't add anything to it. All right, it looks like people are doing great. I'm going to do mine up here. Can we talk about each one of these? It looked like people were doing great. Um, I did the, the top row there. You basically want to do this by drawing in straight line segments and then filling them in. So for this weird shape here, I would draw that straight line, that straight line, and then fill all this in here. I hope that everybody has gotten more or less shapes like this. Uh, this little sort of house, you can draw two straight lines here and here, and then fill it in. Maybe I'll use the red so you can see. This one here already is convex, the circle. It is convex already, and so you don't have to add anything to it. Um, this sort of moon-like shape we already saw. You should add a straight line in that position, right? I saw some people as I was walking around. Some people were getting getting a little um, a little greedy or something, and like did something like this, make it into a circle. Actually, that's too much when you're making the convex hull. You want to add as little area as possible in order to make it convex. So rather than that curvy thing, you should just make a straight line across like that. And then, of course, fill it in. All right. Uh, the triangle, what did you do to the triangle? Nothing. Yeah, the triangle is already convex, so you shouldn't add anything to it. And the worm here, the happy worm, um, you need to add in basically one straight segment like this all right and then fill everything in all right any questions about any of those i hope that that uh, uh it's i think it's a simple idea it's just you have to get used to geometrically what it looks like all right and remember like it is important that you are using the smallest possible shape so i drew a straight line here if you drew sort of a bendy line that would make it bigger than it has to be all right the straight line is going to make it convex, but not any bigger than it needs to be. All right, excellent. That's what the convex hull means. Now, what all of this has to do with wiggly shapes versus non-wiggly shapes, that's really what we want to talk about. Um, I'm going to go back to my notes here. Wiggly versus non-wiggly shapes. I would like you to notice, note, If you have a nice looking shape, like say, uh, actually any ordinary um, looking polygon, a regular polygon, is all, um, this shape is automatically already convex, right? So this, this nice shape is the same as the convex hull, right? And you saw this a few times on your paper. Some of those shapes, the, and sort of the nice looking ones, are already the same as the convex hull, right? This nice shape is the same as its convex hull. Uh, a sort of nice but slightly wiggly shape, something like this maybe. This is not the same as the convex hull. To get the convex hull, I would have to add in a few little, little bits here to tidy up the wiggles, but I would say generally, that last line wasn't very good. I'd have to fill that stuff in. But anyway, what I'm saying here is this, um, I would say slight, 
slightly wiggly shape is mostly the same as its convex hull, right? They're, I mean, they're different, but not, not very different. You just have to fill in a little, a few little bits. This slightly wiggly shape is mostly the same as its convex hull. But what about a real sort of squirmity wormity shape, you know, like this? That shape is very different from its convex hull, right? If you start with that shape and you make the convex hull, you have to add huge amounts of extra stuff that wasn't there before, right? In order to make it convex. So this wormy shape is very different from the convex hull. And that's why this is interesting from the point of view of measuring how wiggly a shape is. This wormy shape is very different from its convex hull. All right. That's the point. That's why the convex hull is useful in measuring how wormy or how wiggly a shape is. Now, I can tell you the definition. We're not going to have time to do a lot of examples, but we'll do them next time. Um, the definition of the convex hull ratio The convex hull ratio. This is the specific number which tells you how wiggly the shape is in terms of how different is it from its own convex hull. Uh, the convex hull ratio is, I'm usually going to write this as CH for convex hull. And it's a ratio, so it's a fraction, which, like I said, you can usually write as a percentage if you want to. Anyway, it's the area of the shape divided by the area of the convex hull. That's how we do it. You take the area of each of these shapes and you make that fraction. The area of the original shape divided by the area of the convex hull. You know, the convex hull is always obtained by adding some more stuff. Um, and that's why uh, the denominator here is always going to be bigger. It's not, it's not possible for the numerator of this fraction to be bigger. Um, they could be equal, but the denominator will always be greater or equal to the numerator here. All right. So for a nice shape, can we just think about this as a number? For a nice shape, I'll put this in quotes. What I mean by nice is like not so wiggly, not, not like a worm shape, but more like a, a, a blobby shape that's not a worm. For a nice shape, the uh, top and the bottom of this fraction are pretty close, right? Like we said before, in a nice shape, the convex hull is mostly the same as the original shape. And so when you make that fraction there, the numerator and the denominator of the fraction are pretty close. So the convex hull ratio will be close to 1, right? Because the this fraction its numerator and its denominator are close together. And so its value as a fraction will be close to 1, or in a percentage, it will be close to 100%. All right. But for a super wormy shape, for a wiggly shape, the bottom, that's the convex hull, will be much bigger. Right? Because on a super wormy shape, in order to make it convex, you have to add in a lot of extra area. And so in that fraction, the denominator will be much bigger. So the convex hull as a number will be close to, what, it, what is it if the fraction has a denominator that's much bigger than the numerator? What does that look like as a number? The denominator is a lot bigger. I'm imagining something like, one over a thousand or something? Closer to zero. Yeah, it's close to zero, right? If the numerator and denominator are, are almost the same as each other, that fraction will be close to one. If the bottom is much bigger than the top, this uh, will be close to zero. And that's how you can use this number to tell if a shape is super wiggly or not, all right? 
one major problem with like for us doing this by hand in class is um, finding the area of a shape, which that's what this fraction is about. It's about the areas of those two shapes. Finding the area of a weird wiggly shape is not at all easy to do on a piece of paper. Like, um, if I asked you to find me the area of that happy little worm on the paper there, anybody know how to do that? The answer is no. There isn't, like, did you, when you were a kid, did you learn the formula for the area of a happy little worm? No, you didn't. Um, I mean, there is, it does have an area, but it's not obvious at all how you would figure it out. So. These ones in the real world, you basically would use a computer to find the area. You use a sort of super detailed map, and there are, it's not so hard if you're using a computer to find areas. But um, on paper, we are going to concentrate on maps that look like rectangular grids, which are like ones that we've, uh, we've looked at before. Um, I would, maybe we'll, we've only got five minutes. I'll just do one example like this, and then we'll, we'll do more next time. I have another handout with a bunch of these grids on it. But um, I'll, I'll hand this out next time. But let's just talk about um, this one here. So what you see is the black shape there. I would like to find the convex hull ratio of this shape. What we need to do is we're going to compare the area of the original shape versus the area of the convex hull. And since I drew it on a grid here, the area you can find just by counting up the squares, right? So. In this first example, the area is, I'm going to count, you know, the black squares here. I mean the area of the black, the, the shaded in one. So the area would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20. 23. I think I did that right. Anybody agree? I think that's 23. So the area here is 23. What about the area of the convex hull? Actually, this is not so hard to do. I can, first of all, draw the convex hull. I'm going to do this in red. Look at this picture here, and we have to add in pieces to make it convex. So for example, I would add in down here. I would cut this diagonal like that, right? And then I would also, over here, cut up like that, right? I'm filling in all the, the inny parts. And I would also cut like that and like this and then take the entire inside of this whole region, right? That is the convex hull, which is outlined in red. And that also, we can find the area by counting the, the squares. Now, sometimes we're going to get half squares. And you'll just have to count half squares. That's not such a big deal, though, right? So I get, maybe I'll do the halves first, just because I don't like keeping track of the halves. I see a half, a half here, a half here, a half here a half here, and a half here, and a half here, right? Everywhere else is a hole. So that was one, two, three, four, five, six halves. So that's three. And then I'm just going to count all of the full dots on the inside, starting with three, right? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. All right, so the convex hull area is 34. All right, this is how we do an example like this. And so what's my final answer for the convex hull ratio? It is 23 divided by 34, whatever that is. As usual, you can do that on your calculator if you want to, although you know, on our quiz or something, I would expect you to just leave it like that. It's pretty close to one, I suppose. I don't know, it's like 2 thirds, right? All right, this is how we do it in, in, uh, in, uh, in examples like this. Next time, uh, we'll do a bunch of practice with these. I think that'll do for today.